Okay, remember everybody needs to mute their and microphone on your computers while you're in Zoom. Yes, because you're using the other microphone. You can mute that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this special meeting of the Kensington Police Protection and Community Service District. Today's May 11th, and the time is 6.02. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, Linnell, can you help us with roll call? Duggan? Yes. Director Hossai? Here. Vice President Goff? Here. Director Spath? Here. And President Aquino Fight. Here. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we appreciate everyone coming out and joining us during your busy week. Thank you for your patience with the KPPCSD Police Department and District Office Permanent Location Committee. Uh, we're going to do something a little different uh, with the special meeting. We will let Vice President Goff run through the presentation and then let directors uh, make comments and then the public. I know we're all eager, eager to hear this update, but I ask that you please hold your comments and questions until the end. Okay, um, as you will hopefully soon understand in greater detail, Vice President Goff and I have been working tirelessly since we took office to meet one of our biggest campaign goals. That is to immediately analyze the facts at hand, speak with key stakeholders and experts within this district and assess if it would be possible within this district's means to house our police department with, uh, back in the PSB and thus determine if joint occupancy of, of the PSB was a reasonable option. Before Vice President Goff begins, I wanna thank a few folks. First, obviously, Vice President Goff, thank you for your patience, your diligence, your ability to think outside the box and your incredible work ethic. This was not an easy endeavor to take on as new board members uh, in this current climate and with the current challenges our district faces. I also wanna thank the many experts we consulted over the past few months with a special thank you to our current police chief, Mike Gancas, each of the experts that Sarah and I met with have generously given their us their time, expertise, and advice. I also wish to thank our prior and current interim GMs for their partnership in exploring these incredibly complex questions as a special district. And of course, I wish to thank our current colleagues on the fire board uh, who met with us to explore options. I wanna underscore a few things before she gets started. This has been a very challenging and sensitive topic for a while, and many of us have strong opinions on what should be the right path forward. I ask that we, um, you again, hold your comments to the end and that you remain civil and respectful with each other and with the board. I have brought my old Berkeley Law School gavel with me tonight and don't make me use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vice President Goff, take it away. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. Okay, thank you, President Goff. You can get started. Thank you, President Aquino Fike. I know I sometimes speak softly, so I hope everyone can hear me. You'll let me know if you can at any point. Hope everybody's comfortable. This might take a little while. <laughs> so um, I'll try to get right to it. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to hear this update on joint occupancy. Please note that this verbal update will be accompanied by this PowerPoint presentation, which will be shared as I speak tomorrow on the KPPCSD website and in printed copies at the district offices in El Cerrito by Tuesday. As always, this meeting will be recorded and Linnell will provide a summary for the minutes. The police department and district office permanent location committee, among other things, 
was tasked with fully exploring the possibility of joint occupancy of fire and police in the PSB, even though construction was already underway. Given this reality, we understood that this issue must be our immediate top priority. At the formation of the committee in January 2023, the roof and interior of the PSB had already been substantially demolished pursuant to the currently approved plans to retrofit and renovate for the fire district's exclusive use. Tonight, we will share our committee's key findings and conclusion on joint occupancy because the uncertainty and speculation around this issue continue to divide this community and are becoming harmful distractions. Resolution is needed now and will be provided tonight. First, I will go into the factors influencing whether the police can return to the PSB, including the various space considerations and expert input. And then I will explain the factors influencing whether they should return to the PSB, including costs, potential impacts to service, and other concerns raised in the community. Finally, I will share our key findings and ultimate conclusion on joint occupancy based on the totality of all of the information learned during the course of our committee work. The chain of events that have led us all to this moment are long, complicated, and frustrating. We will not rehash them all again here. Suffice to say, there were many points in the previous years and even recently in which greater collaboration and transparency might have yielded a different result. However, that is not where we find ourselves, and so we must acknowledge the present facts. And so with this, we turn to the primary questions to be answered. Number one, can the Kensington Police Department return to the PSB? And number two, should the police return to the PSB? The factors influencing whether the KPD can return to the PSB are first and foremost, the police space considerations. For the sake of exploration and argument, we focused only on the current bare minimum needs of our Kensington police force as they currently operate. That is our baseline for this analysis. We did not account for most district administration space needs or plan for the expansion of the KPD in any way. So let's look at the non-negotiable Kensington Police Department space needs. These are bare minimum core functions of our existing force. What they would need space for are, and you can see here, some small police administrative or receptionist workspace lobby area, a chief's office, a lieutenant's office, a shared sergeant's office for two people, a patrol room with two workstations, that would be two computers and a desk, a police support staff workspace, a locker room, it could be all gender, 10 lockers, evidence storage cabinet and refrigeration, guns, ammunition storage cabinet, but secure, some secure file storage, some secure equipment storage, a space for office supplies in a printer area, some space for janitorial and cleaning storage, two bathrooms, one for staff only and one for staff and public, a computer server IT room, a small break space with a small sink, mini fridge, counter cabinets, a table with a couple chairs, and secure parking for seven patrol vehicles. So these are the the non-negotiable bare minimum of the KPD. However, there are many additional standard police department space needs. These are typical needs, not Taj Mahal. Many of these additional features are viewed as standard and are found in PDs across the country. Things like some kind of conference meeting or training room, adequate storage for equipment and files, additional workstations for other personnel, individual supervisor offices versus shared, an armory room, an evidence room, a custody processing area, an interview room, file cabinets for personal workstation items, gender specific locker room and showers, an exercise room, 
a volunteer workspace, designated live scan machine area, some staff parking, and some visitor parking. So with all of this, we have to estimate the minimum square footage needs for the non-negotiable KPD functions. Those are the functions I first mentioned, the bare minimum. So this is what we know. The current portables are 2,880 square feet. We spoke with Chief Gankas and he believes if necessary, he could get down to 2,000 square feet for just police. The Moraga Police Department, which is most comparable in size to our own, is 1,800 square feet plus supplemental offsite storage for evidence, files, and equipment. So we're estimating our bare minimum for core KPD functions to be in the neighborhood of 1,600 to 2,000 square feet. From what we know from the available exclusive first floor space in the public safety building that could be available for police per Director Watts' proposed plans is 1,144 square feet. Now, I will note that that number has not been independently verified by us because to do so would require us to hire an architect and pay that person. So we're, for the sake of argument, going with Director Watts' number of 1144. Now we look at the other factors impacting available PSB space, the second floor. It was immediately apparent that modifications to both floors of the PSB at this stage of construction with the design as it is would be far too costly, disruptive, and problematic. So we removed it from further consideration. Only use of the first floor of the PSB by the police was considered a realistic possibility at this stage. So now we look at some new non-discretionary public safety building features impacting this available first floor space. This will not be the building of 1971. We now know that there will definitely be an elevator and an elevator machine storage room. We know that if police are in there, there has to be a secure IT server space or room. There will be larger code compliance stairs. There will be a fire decontamination area. And the positions of the one single stall first floor bathroom and shear walls are fixed and cannot be changed as recently determined by the fire board. At this point, I would like to take the opportunity to clarify remarks by former interim Kensington Chief of Police, Steve Simpkins, who has been cited often as someone who once said that joint occupancy was possible. When I spoke to him directly, he gave me permission to share his comments and explain. In truth, what Chief Simpkins said at the time was that if an elevator needed to go into the PSB, that there was no way for the police to fit back in there. He also explained that he was unaware that a new server room would be required. We now know that an elevator and elevator storage closet will go into the PSB and that a server room is a requirement of the DOJ Criminal Justice Information System, CG, CJIS, for warrants and other purposes. So let me summarize these issues around the KPD space needs and the available PSB space for police. Essentially, despite excluding most district administration and several standard features of many police departments and drastically underestimating the minimum dimensions for each room, i.e. cramming everything in there and ignoring all county code requirements and police building standards, we are still short about 450 to 850 square feet. This assumes, again, the 1144 square foot on the first floor of the PSB for the police and our minimum estimate of core functions of around 1600 to 2000 that we need. So simple subtraction there. So how could we make up for this shortfall? That's when we turn to the dual site concept. We asked, what KPD operational functions could reasonably and responsibly be cited elsewhere in addition to the public safety building? One well, for this, we turned to many police public safety building experts and they weighed in. 
We spoke of, curse, of course, first and foremost to Chief Gankas, our current KPD chief. As I mentioned, I also spoke directly with Steve Simpkins, former Kensington Interim Chief of Police, and Walt Schold, former Kensington Chief of Police. President Kino Fike spoke with Hank Schreeder, former police chief for Santa Rosa and interim police chief of Emeryville and Novato. I spoke with John King, the current chief of police of Moraga, and Candace Wong, a public safety building expert and principal architect at 10 Over Studio. And now I can summarize their, their input. We have these main takeaways that should be noted. But first, let me make clear that none of these experts contradicted each other and many repeated the same concerns. Number one, separation of essential police operations is undesirable generally. Number two, separation of essential police operations is especially undesirable for smaller departments like ours. The smaller the police department, the more important it is to have everything in one location. And these are due to concerns around efficiency, supervision, and police culture. So first, efficiency. If functions are separated, staff will lose valuable service time going in circles from one location to the next. In terms of supervision, personnel and features like evidence and weapons need adequate supervision and security at all times. Poor supervision can lead to major problems down the road and is often a factor in some of the bad news stories we see today. Police culture. Police have their own culture and there are things that are important to them that may not be obvious or important to others in different work environments. Things like team unity, leadership, rank, and a level of professionalism in the workplace greatly impact staff morale. This said, there are a few features that technically can be housed off-site if necessary. Evidence and some storage, if properly secured, could be located away from the main department reasonably. However, off-siting only these things would still not free up enough square footage to compensate for the several hundred square foot shortfall. Off-site multi-site scenarios are more typical for large sheriff's departments in which whole units or divisions like the traffic division, for example, can be relocated without compromising efficiency, supervision, or morale. So now we look to the proposed joint occupancy concepts before us. We all are familiar with the Bart Jones plan and the Jim Watts plans, and he had a number of iterations. So there are version one, two, three, and four, I believe. And I would, and I, we would both like to say that we appreciate and thank Bart and Jim for their personal investment and concern. As private citizens at first, uh, they really have gone above and beyond for the good of their community and their contributions should be recognized. However, we reviewed these plans thoroughly and without going into extensive detail here, we concluded that none of them offer a workable solution to joint occupancy. All of their plans eliminate many essential, non-negotiable, bare minimum police functions, and they dramatically underestimate room sizes and space needs. And finally, they do not factor in additional police building design considerations, such as sight lines, public exposure to secure confidential assets, security reinforcement, positioning of supervisors relative to officers, human resource concerns, and many other things. So there were other joint occupancy concepts. In addition to the plans proposed by these community members, our committee proposed various iterations to the PSB first floor lay layout to Chief Gankas. While there were points at which it seemed a compromise solution might be reached, ultimately the chief concluded that he could not recommend any joint occupancy configuration, including the dual site options we proposed. But we must also consider other things like 
police and public safety building design considerations generally, and what we've learned from Chief Gankes and all the experts. Simply put, walls cannot just be thrown up or features made to fit anywhere after the fact. Designing a police station involves expertise, planning, and strategy. A great deal of forethought goes into police building design in order to facilitate efficient and professional police operations, while at the same time protecting the public's safety and information. All of these considerations are only compounded in a dual agency joint occupancy scenario such as ours. Note I said compounded, not impossible. With sufficient early planning, robust collaboration between the two agencies, and adequate square footage, a reasonable public safety building design hosting two agencies is possible. Unfortunately, that is not our situation now. So now we turn to the financial cost to join occupancy. I'm gonna give you some disclaimers around these numbers. The numbers provided here are illustrative only for the sole purpose of exploring joint occupancy. We at this stage are not recommending a particular option or advocating for any specifics in terms of features or square footage for the police. Also, most of the numbers we will share are rough estimates only, except in the few cases where exact figures are already known. To obtain precise, truly accurate estimates would require an approved concept followed by architectural plans that could then be given to a contractor for a real bid. Due to certain access issues and in the interest of saving time and money, we obtained ballpark estimates from real estate professionals and public safety building expert architect Candace Wong, all of whom are familiar with Bay Area pricing and qualified to speak on the subject. Finally, I should add that there are additional costs to the development of any tracts of land that are unknowable at this stage. For instance, site work is highly variable depending on the grade and the condition of the land and many other factors. The cost might be inconsequential or substantial based on a particular lot. So with that, we turn first to Director Watts' proposed terms for joint occupancy. These terms were proposed by Director Watt in the context of our two by two committee meetings and discussions, though they were not fireboard approved. Because it is our understanding that some of these terms are already in the public domain, we will share our perspective on them here. Director Watt proposed that the KPPCSD could be a tenant in perpetuity at a nominal rent, which means we would have a right to remain forever in the PSB, paying virtually nothing in terms of rent. This would have a similar effect to ownership, but we would be tenants and have no actual ownership interest in the building. So for this right to be tenants, it was proposed that the KPPCSD would pay a pro rata share of the total PSB construction project cost of $6.8 million. Our pro rata, pro rata amount would be calculated as a percentage of exclusive police space in the PSB, which is 19% if you go by the 1,144 square feet available to, to police on the first floor only. That would give us an amount that the KPPCSD would have to pay to the KFPD of $1.3 million, roughly. And for that $1.3 million, the KPCSD, KPPCSD would have the space delivered by the KFPD in a shell condition. So then, logically, the KPPCSD would then need to pay the costs for the tenant improvements needed to convert that public safety building space from shell into a usable police space, including all furniture, fixtures, and equipment. For this estimate, I turn to Candace Wong, who again is a principal architect with 20 years public safety building design experience in uh, California. She estimates this additional cost to the KPPCSD for tenant improvements to be about 
1.184 million or around $2 million. And this is based on a calculation using a, a cost per square foot of $750 for the hard cost on 1,144 square feet, a 20% design contingency, which is standard, and about 18% in soft costs for architectural engineering, permitting, and special inspections, since it's a public safety building, all of which would be required. So we have the 1.3 million to be a tenant and have the space turned over as a shell, plus the nearly 1.2 million to convert it from shell to usable space. But as I mentioned earlier, 1144 square feet is not enough space for even our most essential core police functions. So there would have to be a second site. The cost to purchase and renovate a minimum of that 450 to 850 square feet for the KPD functions that cannot fit into the 1144 on the first floor is estimated to be around a million dollars to two million. And that is based on the same calculation for tenant improvements and a purchase price of as low as around $500,000 for, for a small space like that. And these uh, comparables were offered to us by a commercial real estate agency. And that gives the total for joint occupancy to be estimated at around $3.5 million to $4.5 million for the KPPCSD. So now let's turn to a few comparisons. Reciting the current portables. Now these figures can be known a bit more precisely. We know how much it would be to purchase and move them and roughly to recite them. And that's calculated at around $417,000. But then of course, we would need the land to set them on. Basing it off of what the KFPD pays for their current space, it would be as a, if a lease space around $1,300 a month. If we purchased a site of about 10,000 to 15,000 square feet, it would be about a million dollars to a million five. So the total cost with purchase land with the portables is estimated at a million point five to two million dollars, and much less as a rental on on land, a lease on land. Then we turn to a traditional new construction building of only two thousand square feet for police only needs, bare minimum. This calculation is based on a $1,200 per square foot uh, cost for the 2,000 square foot building, a 20% contingency and the 18% soft costs. And that gives us a total cost estimated for a building of that size at about $2.4 million. Of course, it would also need land. So using the same size of land, 10,000 to 15,000 square foot, uh, plot of land, it would be about a million to a million five. That gives an estimated for only a 2,000 square foot building at being around 3.4 million to 3.9 million. And finally, we looked into non traditional steel construction buildings. Our interim GM, David Aranda, was familiar with steel, steel building construction because they used one for their police department in Stallion Springs, and it was a very low cost option. These steel providers exist in the Bay Area as well, and the costs here fall somewhere between the modulars and a stick-built traditional building. The shell is quite inexpensive at around 50,000, but it has to be built out as well, and that's estimated at 300,000 to 600,000. And then of course the land of the same size at a million to a million five, that gives an estimate for the steel construction at 1.35 to 2.15 million. So clearly, when we examine all of these options, we can see that joint occupancy is not a low cost option and is unlikely to be our lowest cost option. So now we turn to factors influencing whether the KPD should return to the PSB. We look at impacts to quality of Kensington Police Service. I already discussed the supervision, efficiency, morale, and leadership issues. So I won't go into them again here.
However, I should mention the recruiting and retention concerns. Police departments nationwide are facing recruiting and retention challenges. San Francisco is offering $75,000 signing bonuses. Richmond PD is reportedly down about 60 officers and Peninsula officers are being paid shockingly high salaries. Kensington simply cannot compete with those financial incentives. A cramped work environment that lacks basic modern police functions is a deterrent to hiring and a motivation to leave. It would only exacerbate an already challenging police workplace dynamic, workforce dynamic. And anecdotally, we've heard that job candidates and staff have expressed that they would not work in the PSB under any condition. Now we turn to the KFPD Leaseback Agreement and Alquist Priolo Act. We heard these concerns raised by the community and believed that they warranted further investigation. As such, we sought legal advice from Bob Stein, an experienced attorney with a long and distinguished career and who is familiar with commercial loan and leaseback agreements. We also spoke with my husband, John Goff, who has years of commercial real estate lending experience, decades of corporate bank experience, and is currently a senior investment professional. These two are without question qualified to speak on these topics, and we were happy and grateful to get their free expert advice. Essentially, we learned that the community concerns raised are valid and should not be wholesale dismissed. Without elaborating too much here, though I can later if necessary, it is clear that given our particular facts and circumstances, as well as macroeconomic factors, such as dramatically higher interest rates and instability in the banking sector, that any request for space in the PSB by the KPP CSD would present unjustifiably high risks to both districts. We are unwilling to ask our board to assume those risks. So now we turn to feasibility and logistics. It is important to note the logistical challenges of attempting joint occupancy of the PSB at this stage. First, access to necessary information is one concern. The KPPCSD is not a party to the KFPD's contracts with Marjong, the architect, MAC5, the contractor, or Capital One for the leaseback agreement. So it is not appropriate or possible for us to approach them directly for actionable information on the design, costs, timing, associated financial risks, or even their openness to working with us. I think we all witnessed the challenges the fire board faced in seeking information on only two modest changes to the current design. That is relocating the bathroom and adding a water feature. Imagine the impracticality of the KPPCSD seeking information on a full reconfiguration of the first floor to accommodate the police. Due to these access issues and the many steps required to change an existing design and construction plan, it's also highly improbable that any of the necessary information could be obtained in a timely manner. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to add that the many concerns raised by our police and fire personnel did not fall on deaf ears, and I do not find them to be unreasonable. We noted their very public opposition to joint occupancy based on things like the likelihood of creating a negative dynamic between police and fire, the concern with exposing fire personnel to police guns, ammos, controlled substance, substances, suspects, and evidence, the lack of staff parking if police patrol vehicles take seven of eight available spaces, the problems inherent with conflicting agency schedules and the reality that the firehouse doubles as both a home and a workspace, worries about delaying fires return to the PSB given concerns about equipment and the current living conditions, and many other things. Therefore, given the totality of all of these many facts and circumstances as we now know them, our committee is prepared to make the following key findings. 
Number one, the Kensington Police Department should be housed under one roof with no separation of core operational functions. Number two, the current KPD core operational functions cannot physically fit into the PSB under any joint occupancy scenario. Number three, a return of our KPD to the PSB would likely require unacceptable compromises to the quality of our police services. Number four, joint occupancy is not a low cost option and is highly unlikely to be our lowest cost option. And five, pursuit of joint occupancy poses other unnecessary risks to the KPPCSD and KFPD. Conclusion, even when viewed in a light most favorable to joint occupancy, it is clear that continuing to seek police space in the PSB is no longer a reasonable path forward. Therefore, this committee will not recommend a return of the KPD to the PSB. Instead, we will focus our committee efforts only on options that will allow our police department to remain together in one location and able to provide the level of service we now expect. Before handing over to President Aquino Fike, I would like to add my personal hope that this final determination on joint occupancy will allow our community to close this painful chapter once and for all. As you have just seen and heard, President Aquino Fike and I investigated the possibility of joint occupancy intensely and thoroughly from every conceivable angle. And it is now beyond clear to us, and I hope to all of you, that there is no longer a viable or reasonable path forward. That said, a solution to locating our police exists and will be found. But in order to find it, we must focus our limited time and resources only on the reasonable options, learning from our past mistakes, but looking to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Goff. Um, I'd like to now turn to my colleagues on the board. Are there any comments or questions? Director Hassai. I just wanted to uh, reiterate, um, which I'm sure you're gonna hear a lot of, great thanks. This is an excellent, excellent report, slicing and dicing it from so many ways with lots of information coming at you. I think it's wonderful. I, I think the only thing I, I'm curious about is sometimes the square footage numbers, but I think there were ranges. Uh, so I may be doing some calculations myself, but um, if there's any more work done on this, that's the only thing I would be interested in, but it is super excellent and I really appreciate it. Director Spath. Uh, I'd like to echo what um... Member Hosai had said this is an excellent report, a lot of good work that's gone into it, and I appreciate it very, very much. I think you've made a solid case for not co-locating. Frankly, I would add another factor to that, and that is the earthquake risk that uh, would be posed on this building. Um, I don't know if anyone has looked at the seismic risk assessment that the Fire Board commissioned in 2021, and that assessment essentially found that, depending upon the size of an earthquake on the Haywood Fault, this building would not be functional for a few months to up to a year. So when you add that to the equation and the possibility that you would be potentially not in the building for that length of time, it just adds more evidence to the fact that co-location doesn't make sense. And I would add that the U.S. Geological Service has indicated that there's a one in three chance of an earthquake on the Haywood Fault within 30 years. So I would not roll the dice uh, under those circumstances. And thank you again for your great work. Uh, Director Duggan. 
Thank you for taking this difficult and contentious job on. I want to say, each and every one of you, aren't you glad you didn't have to do that work? <laughs> Thank you. I personally am grateful. This makes consolidation look even more urgent. Kensington needs one board that can consider all of Kensington's needs for any decision. One board with one budget that always takes everything into consideration. So you'll see later on the agenda, we're moving on to try to push that forward. Um, I have a question. Have you asked the Unitarian Universalist Church regarding long-term or temporary rental of this site, although it isn't in Kensington, which is not as great, and also have any other potential locations for the modulars in Kensington been investigated? I can answer that question on the Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, yes, we have been in communication. I personally have been in communication with the executive director of the congregation. Um, and uh, she has brought this question to their board. Uh, there have been no objections so far, but we need to schedule a formal meeting with our interim GM, Aranda, and her and myself. Um, and then likely there will be follow-up meetings with uh, relevant uh, board members, um, Chief Cancas. Uh, so we are very early in that in that discussion. Um, and, but it is it's, it's definitely a live question, and it hasn't been closed yet. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to the other sites. Yes. Um, thank you. So um, we have in, uh, communicated with the commercial real estate firm, which has toured, um, provided a tour of potential sites in Kensington. Um, I will say for now, there's no, um, we're not ready to make any kind of recommendation. And the, the point of this special meeting is really limited to giving an update on joint occupancy. We, this is not us providing a recommendation of where the police will go. There's much more work to be done. It's going to take a lot more work and a lot of creativity, but there are options and we will find it. Director Hassai. I just want to draw um, new board members' attention and public's attention to the fact that once we begin looking at other options, um, real estate negotiations are handled in closed session uh, for good reasons. And so that may not be something that will be discussed um, as openly in public. And um, I just want to draw everyone's attention to that. Thanks for the reminder. Um, before we turn to the public comment, um, I'd like to make a few remarks. Again, thank you, Vice President Goff, for walking us through that presentation. I want to underscore that this was not a decision I took lightly. I personally am very disappointed that joint occupancy of the PSB is no longer a viable option because of factors beyond this board's control. When Sarah and I took office, I learned that in many ways, the table had already been set. We did not have the flexibility or time, given the construction and financing constraints, constraints to redesign the interior of the PSB as we had hoped. We did not have access to key information relating to the financial costs associated with redesigning our possible portion of the PSB. We could not in good faith bring these ideas, uh, with, which, which had not even been vetted by the entire fire board, without this information. But even if those factors had been favorable to us, the expert opinions we received, the facts before us, all lead to the disappointing, for me personally, conclusion that housing our police in the PSB with the fire department was not a reasonable path forward anymore for this board, given the plans and their constraints that had been approved by the prior fire board. As I stated before, the table had already been set. Since day one, we've been working strenuously and creatively daily to find options. We've reached a point where we've concluded that joint occupancy is no longer a viable option. And like Vice President Goff stated, it's time for this committee to focus its efforts on exploring alternative options for housing the police in Kensington. We invite collaborative, community-minded thinking to solve the issue in front of us, to maintain high-quality police in Kensington in a fiscally prudent manner. So there are two things that I will be focused on from here on out. One, 
finding a location for the police and how to keep high quality police services in Kensington in a fiscally prudent manner. Two, consolidation. As I've learned from this work with Vice President Goff, it's absolutely critical for our two boards to consolidate. We cannot afford as a community to find ourselves again in a situation where two boards with distinct missions take decisions that do not keep our entirety, our community as a whole front and center. It's time to get rid of this dysfunction and the inefficiencies. Kensington deserves better. I look forward to working with all of you towards this goal. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, uh, Director uh, Duggan. Just a few more comments. I definitely am disappointed. We ran hoping to achieve this goal. We, you know, those of us from Save Kensington's Future, um, I'm hoping we will explore possible use of the annex building over there for admin personnel only. Um, of course, I am not in any way in support of putting any part of the actual police force in any part of this park. And I'll speak to that a little more in my director notes later. Um, I wonder if we could revisit 301 Arlington for police only and put the admin staff somewhere else. You know, I would like us to hire a grant writer and explore options of, you know, getting some money to build better buildings. Uh, there are CAL FIRE grants out there that could be maybe, you know, once our board is consolidated, maybe we could get a CAL FIRE grant, make a better police station elsewhere, put the police in what will be the fire station. You know, let's be creative. I, I would love to see us use all possible resources out there. Um, I'm good at finding money. I think we need to have that attitude that we are going to find some money to make a great police station and to make sure the you know, the fire station is high quality and it's just a matter of time. So, you know, that would be my goal. If if I would vote yes on modulars for now, it would be, you Thank know, you. five years ahead, a much better real police station centrally located in Kensington because people want to have the police there within a few minutes. You know, we we could do it. Kensington has great police services now, and I just want to make them even better. Thank you. Thank you, Director Duggan. Okay, let's turn to, oh, excuse me, Director Spath. Yeah, let, me, let me just echo what uh, Member Duggan has said. Um, we should be looking at grants, and FEMA is a possibility. It may be a long shot, but they will give grants for communities that are threatened by hazards, such as earthquakes and wildfire. And in this case, with the earthquake um, situation that we have with the Haywood Fault, there's quite a strong possibility that we could make the case to get a grant from FEMA, which would defray a considerable amount of the cost. So I certainly would urge the board to uh, to move forward in that regard. It's not an easy issue to deal with. FEMA has a lot of requirements and criteria. It'll take a little while, but it's certainly worth the effort. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, turning to public comment, um, interim three minutes again. <laughs> Let me just give you some quick instructions. So if you'd like to make a comment on a specific, on a, what we discussed today, please raise your hand if you're in the room or if you're on Zoom. Uh, I think I think they can raise their hand, and um, you'll have three minutes. Please state your name clearly for the audio recording. You're requested to address your comments to the president and the board, and not to staff or the other or the audience. Um, so let's first go to folks here in the room. If you would like to make a comment or have a question, please raise your hand. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Lynn Dew. I just wanted to point out that when we talk about having the police in Kensington, that the, the Unitarian, the space at the Unitarian parking lot is literally on the border. Yes, it's in El Cerrito, but the back of that lot is the Kensington El Cerrito line. 
I mean, who knows, maybe El Cerrito would even deed that little section <laughs> to Kensington so we could say the police were in Kensington. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few remarks. I really appreciate the work of the committee. Um, obviously, you've spent a significant amount of time working on this issue, and you have still now a lot of work ahead of you to solve this next question about where do we locate the police. Um, I do want to also, though, uh, express my disappointment, as was uh, expressed by other directors here, that the joint occupancy is now not an option. Like many members in this community, I was highly concerned that the renovation of the PSB was not being approached in a coordinated manner, most clearly evident by the fact that decisions to contract for the renovation of the PSB was underway without a home for the police identified, and many of the locations that were being discussed were alarming to the community. As Vice President Goff stated in the presentation, um, the committee, I paraphrase here, believes that with sufficient early planning and robust collaboration, a joint occupancy public safety building would have been possible. I'm not here to rehash or relitigate the past. I don't see much benefit in spending time blaming. However, I do firmly believe that the community's governance structure should be called out as a major contributing factor in our arriving at this, what for me is a disappointing and for many members in this community outcome. And of course, by that I'm referring to the two district and two board structure, which really obstructs holistic, collaborative and community-minded thinking. So I wanna thank the committee for your work and encourage you to move forward with great speed and energy in addressing the issue of consolidating two districts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions here in the room? Uh, Linnell, are there any in uh, on Zoom? Capagrosi. Candace, uh, you can unmute yourself. Yes, I just wanted to thank you. I know this has been a painful learning lesson for the community, and it's not one that people hoped, but I would like to say your analysis was detailed, very competent, and I want to apologize for my ageism view that you might not <laughs> give it um, as much consideration as was due. So I had a learning lesson from this, and I thank you so much for the time that you spent. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments in Zoom? President Stein, you can unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hate when people say, can you hear me? But I'm going to say, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I have a very objective request. And that is that you make public the estimate from Candace Wong, who I, I'm not aware of your board engaging her to provide you with an estimate, but given that she gave you an estimate that you used in your public presentation tonight, could you please make public her estimate to convert um, a shell of the first floor from shell to final, you estimated that to be $1.2 million. And I think the public, um, maybe she did that for free or maybe you engaged her, I don't know. But I think the public deserves to see the, the details of that. Um, secondly, I, I could be wrong. Unfortunately, we didn't see the presentation in advance. So I was making screenshots as we went along to try to keep track of what you were presenting to the public, it's easier after the fact to look back at it than it is to let the public look at it in advance and be prepared to make comments. And given the fact that the fire board didn't see your presentation in advance, 
I'm in the same position as the rest of the public, but your estimate for joint occupancy was based on several lump sums and did not take into account that Director Watt had proposed essentially zero, and I'll call it a dollar because that's what he proposed, lease in perpetuity for the building. And I didn't see a cost benefit analysis between the lump sum payment and the fact that once joint occupancy was established, there would be no further payments um, essentially required. And again, um, he had proposed 1.3 million, this additional 1.2 million from Candace Wong. We haven't seen any formal documentation of that. And then finally, the fact that this presentation bolsters the case for consolidation. I think this presentation disrupts and discourages the case for consolidation. The fire board committee of two who had spent hours investing work and our own personal time to try to give you examples of how three minutes, we, three minutes. Well, if that's it, that's another example of why consolidation is not a tenable prospect. If your joint agency that you'd like to consolidate with is cut off after three minutes trying to give educated and informative feedback to this presentation, I rest my case. Uh, uh, Paul or Vita, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, it's Paul. Uh, two, two things here. Uh, first, uh, at least on our Zoom screen, the ability to see the number of participants on Zoom is disabled. So if you could uh, let us know how many people are in the room and how many people are attending on Zoom, I think that would be informative for at least those of us who aren't there in the room. Uh, sure, we've got, we've got about 12 people in the room and 39 virtual participants. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, secondly, um, I don't know if this is feasible, but uh, I'd like to yield the balance of my three minutes to Julie Stein. I, th I think it's remarkable that the uh, president of the agency that you want to consolidate with gets cut off in mid sentence. And are you not inclined to let her speak further? Thank you. Okay, any other comments in, in, the, in, the, in the virtual? John, you can unmute yourself. Oh. They're new best friends. Yeah, um, my comment is um, I, uh, I'd like to uh, see the report in hard copy. I, I look forward to that. My question is um, how much money does the district have to spend on this uh, adventure about uh, getting a new facility for the police? Uh, do you have a figure yet? Thank you. Um, and you need to mute the folks who were speaking before. They're not muted or removed. They need to be removed as panelists. Hi there. This is Pat Gillette, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. So a couple things. One, thank you for a really comprehensive presentation, Sarah and uh, Alex. Looks like you guys did a lot of work and thank you very much for doing that. Number two, I have the same question that John just had, which is, do we have the money to pay for any of these? <laughs> so 
To me, that should have been the starting point. This is how much money do we have? And then what can we afford to do? Um, so I think that question has to be answered. I think it's critical for the community to understand that. Third, well, I appreciate that there's been struggles between the two boards, current boards, at least that's what it sounds like. Um, I don't think we can forgive the past two boards who got us here in the first place. And that's both the fire board and the previous police board for not taking faster and swifter action to see if there was a way for the two agencies to work together. So that's a sad statement. And finally, um, contrary to your comments, Julie, I believe that this actually says everything you need to say, as Cassandra said, or sorry, Director Dugan said, um, about consolidation. This is why we have to consolidate. This is all Kensington taxpayer money. This is money that we should be using for the benefit of the entire community, not for one district or another. Thank you very much. Because Pat's got a B in her bonnet. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Any other? Okay, Elaine, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, thank you very much for this very detailed presentation. Um, I wanted to mention that cars have actually rammed into 303 Arlington on at least three occasions. You can check with the hardware store. I've even gotten pictures. Cool. Um, so I don't think it's the safest building for our police officers to be in. Um, I can double check and see if I still have pictures of that on my telephone. Um, also, I wanted to mention that uh, my architect actually did drawings a number of years ago. I think he said about 15 years ago on the annex. I asked Mike Logan to reach out and get that information from him when Mike was on the board. Ultimately, a KPP CSD board chose not to invest in the annex at that time because they said, why would we want to invest more money uh, into a building that's on an earthquake fault? So that was their decision all those years ago, but apparently he has drawings and also he has structural, he has all the structural information on the annex as well. Thank you so much for your service, guys. Good night. Thank you. Uh, Rob, you can unmute yourself. Thank you for uh, recognizing me. So I'd just like to state that uh, in this meeting, we have seen a rational, careful, empirical, and thorough analysis and its conclusion at last. Congratulations, well done. And that wasn't so painful. Greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, I actually would like to go back to President Stein. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize, President Stein. I was overwhelmed by all the hands. So um, out of respect to you, I'd like to let you have time to finish your comments. Um, it's, are you, you know, what's confusing is whether you're muted or not muted and the red line <laughs> says that you're anti-muted or muted. So can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, but we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Well, you know, I've totally lost my train of thought and I still maintain that it's pretty disrespectful and discouraging that the president of the board, or frankly, any member of our board who would have chosen to step up and speak tonight would be cut off after three minutes. I mean, you're basically proposing to dissolve our agency. You haven't presented a complete picture of what Director Watt presented to you. You didn't provide us with an advanced notice to be able to review your presentation. I've written down the things that I wished you would have said that you didn't say. 
I completely understand the need for supplemental space. I completely understand that this is not a simple problem to solve, but I'm very discouraged with the spin that you put on it. And I'm going to repeat my request that you make your um, analysis from Candace Wong public. Um, I'd also appreciate if you'd make the interview with former Chief Simpkins public, because I attended all of his public meetings and I never heard him say what you've quoted him as saying. So it would be great if you would make that public. And I'm just going to repeat that I think this experience tonight, at least for me personally, is a huge disincentive to consolidation. Consolidation means both boards working together in a collaborative way. Collaboration in this perspective, in, in my point of view, would have meant saying, and believe me, I've gotten plenty of phone calls saying, have they told you what they're gonna say tonight? And I've, <laughs> I've had to say, I have no idea what they're gonna say tonight. And they are speaking on joint occupancy of the public safety building. And unfortunately we're in the position to say, I have no idea what they're gonna say tonight. That is not what my perspective of consolidation would look like. It's potentially what my fear of reorganization and dissolution of the fire district is going to look like, which is a, a total disregard of the perspective of the fire board. Can, can we ask uh, how should be discussing this because this is veered into another topic and I just want to know whether we should continue. I don't need to continue. I, I've said enough and I was invited to come back. I didn't ask to come back. I was invited to come back. Public safety. Okay, thank, thank you, President Stein. Uh, thank you. I take your, your concerns and questions seriously. Um, uh, we, um, just to be clear, we, we, were not, we were not actually talking about consolidation today officially and definitely not any form of dissolution of the fire board. So oh, Director we, were only talking, we were only talking about the option of joint occupancy. We gave our findings and uh, it's time to move on. But you did allow other comments on consolidation. Okay, thank you, President Stein. Um, so for, we'd like to start responding to some of these questions. So I'm gonna let uh, Director Goff uh, speak. Thank you, President Kino Fike. I'll respond to President Stein's comments, a few of them anyhow. Um, as I said in my disclaimers at the beginning and at various points in the presentation, these were this we were able to get this information that we needed, the numbers, all of the opinions through the graciousness of all of these experts who willingly had phone conversations with us entertained our questions and our hypotheticals and our brainstorming and our concerns and our confusion at no cost to the KPPCSD. They took our phone calls, they reviewed documents, they charged us nothing. Every person we spoke to, whether a prior police professional, current police professional, current practicing principal architect with decades of public safety building experience, banking professionals, lawyers, more than one, they were all qualified to speak. And they did so informally. I don't believe I ever indicated that they did provided a formal analysis, specifically as to Candace Wong. I spoke with her. She walked me through how we could arrive at a very rough ballpark estimate, which is what we needed and was more that we could get in any other way. The only other way to get an accurate estimate is to hire and pay an architect. And in order to do that, you have to have an agreed floor plan, which we did not have either. And since we could not communicate directly with any of the existing providers who 
presumably we would work with if we were going to redesign, we had to find another workaround that would give us the information that we needed and the time that we needed it at no cost. So there's no written analysis. These are phone conversations, including with prior chief Simpkins and others. These were phone conversations and they are not I guess unless someone taps my phone, you know, not recorded to my knowledge, but um, he did give me permission specifically to address those two points. And as to who he spoke to about the elevator issue, he said that he knows that he's, he was introduced to this concept early on. Obviously, the determination of a elevator was not yet resolved. And he spoke to the appropriate board representatives at the time, it may not have been at a public meeting, um, and said, but remembered very clearly what he said. And as I mentioned in another meeting, he follows our meetings. He might be listening tonight and he's aware that I, I would be sharing uh, what he actually said and gave me permission to do so. And I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Director Hassan. I'm just raising my hand because I have a point about this. And in fact, it's possible they provided a letter. I distinctly remember him uh, admitting that he did not know about that server. Uh, that has been reported before. He may have even written a letter uh, to that effect. Uh, so I just want to back that up because that's there. I mean, that's that was known. He felt that he realized he had spoken an error. I'm not sure about the elevator issue. But. Thank you. Um, do you have any other responses to some of the questions or comments? As for, uh, I think she referenced um, Director Watts' terms and um, the thinking behind, so Candace's number, which I already explained, that was based on her estimate and knowledge of square footage costs for tenant improvements. And she noted that these tenant improvements, to get it from the shell to what we would need, would not be a magnificent space. This was just to get it done. Nothing special. Bay Area tenant improvements for a public safety building, 750 square, oh, $750 per square foot, plus the standard contingencies and all of the above. So I did the actual number crunching based on her square footage and all of these other factors she said must be considered and factored into that cost. So you won't find a spreadsheet, you won't find any formal analysis or estimate from her, that's how I got the information. As we've said, it was a very imperfect, difficult process. And we did the best we could getting the information we needed. I echo that. Um, and for I hear everyone's frustration about not having the PowerPoint ahead of time, but I still stand by the decision. I think it was important for us to be focused and present. And the presentation will be uploaded uh, by tomorrow morning. So you all can analyze it and read it at your leisure, send us questions. Um, but it, I wanted everyone to be really present and, and listen. So. Um, that's that. Okay. Any director Duggan. So the community will now be given time to mold this over and we are not making a decision about this until, you know, sometime far in the future. Or, I mean, we're not voting on whether to go with your recommendations tonight right when so there is no there is no vote tonight um the only purpose of this presentation was to share our findings uh, and to recommend that we not explore joint occupancy anymore mm -hmm. the committee comprised of director goff and i will be focusing our sole attention to finding an alternative alternative options for housing the police in kensington mm -hmm. yeah um i also want to just I do want to thank uh, President Stein and Jim Watt uh, for all their hard work on this issue. Jim Watt especially um, jumped in and created architect plans at his own expense and has been trying ongoing to, you know, to redesign, refit, you know, and we all owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Um, as in my opinion, he was important to us six new directors being elected who have a focus on consolidation. And, you know, we all need to thank Jim and Julie for, you know, for, being placeholders, trying to make this work, trying their best to, you know, to
create a plan so that we could put the police back into the PSB. However, given the, you know, the nature of two boards working against each other, it's impossible. And that's why we need to consolidate. Sorry, I keep going back to consolidation. Thank but you. Thank, thank you, you, Jim and Julie. Thank you. Um, we do have someone in the audience um, in Zoom, uh, Andrew Reed. Can I think you can unmute yourself? And then uh, this will be the last comment. We've got to move on to our regular meeting. Very good. Thank you very much for taking my comment. So um, given the report this evening, I certainly understand why one wouldn't think about the joint occupancy in the near term. But I also want to open up a space of thought for another concept that has not been mentioned tonight. And that is, imagine a future a year or two from now and the fire construction is complete. That project is over, occupancy permit has been issued. And you folks are still looking for a space. In as much as it's not ideal or desirable on the part of the police captain to split up service chief, to split up the services, has anybody given financial analytical thought to the idea of expanding the PSB, in other words, having a second remodel where that front is pushed out to the curb as many commercial buildings are? You could get more than 800 square feet if you just did an addition on the front of that building. That is wide open space and you'd have your police in Kensington. So I'd love to see a financial analysis for a phased approach. Your reality check right now for the next year or two, but ultimately expanding that building. And at that point, you could have the police all in one place. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got to wrap up. We were really behind. So um, uh, we're going to close this special meeting. Thank you all for your participation. And we will then call the regular meeting to order. Thank you. This meeting's adjourned. It is now 7.18. We will take a five minute break.
get started again. Um, all right, I would like to call to order our monthly regular meeting. It is now 726. Linnell, can you help us with roll call? Sure, Director uh, Duggan? Here. Director Hasai? Here. Vice President Goff? Here. Director Spath? Here. And President Aquino Fight? Here. Okay, um, public comment. If you would like to make a comment on a specific item on today's regular meeting agenda, please raise your hand if you're in the room or bring the um, the mic, we'll bring the mic to you. Not, not on the agenda. Oh, not on the agenda, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, not on the agenda. Please raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you if you're in the room or if you're in Zoom, raise your hand. Once you're called on, please state your name clearly for the audio recording. You're re requested to address your comments to the president and the board of directors and not to staff or the audience. Remember, you have a time limit of three minutes. Um, so anyone here in the room? Anyone on Zoom? Uh, Ryan, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, good evening, Chair and KPP. CSD directors, that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, Ryan Lau, external affairs representative at AC Transit, uh, here to just encourage you to take an important survey about the AC Transit service and encourage you um, uh, to encourage, sorry, your fellow um, Kensingtonians, is that the term, <laughs> uh, to take the survey as well. Um, AC Transit is doing a top to bottom uh, analysis of our entire system to update um, update the service in the wake of the pandemic. Um, as everybody is probably aware, um, transportation patterns across the region um, and just really the, the country have changed dramatically. Um, and those changes have um, really affected our budget as well as the amount of service that we're able to provide on the road. Um, and so in the process of this uh, updating, um, we want to make sure that um, we're hearing from riders. Obviously, uh, there's no point in sort of uh, reevaluating our service if we don't know what meet, need, need we're trying to meet. Um, so we want to make sure that we have um, sufficient input. Um, so later tonight, um, I'll forward an email with some additional information as well as ways that you can kind of share share that out to your fellow um, residents um, via, uh, I don't know what mechanisms um, you communicate, uh, newsletters or social media or what have you, but um, would really appreciate that. Um, so through most of May, um, you will likely see AC Transit staff at bus stops talking to transit riders um, and encouraging them to uh, complete the survey. Um, and that feedback will um, inform our planning efforts and we'll develop a few different iterations of a service network, um, which will come back um, and sort of vet that again with our um, communities um, to make sure that we got it right or, um, you know, have our community members identify the things that they do like or don't like or um, what they'd like to see change and then we'll come back again with a final um, product um, and go through the whole public hearing process and hope to have a new um, service network in place by august 24th um, if you have any questions or want more information uh, again, I'll email you so you can always shoot something back, but you can um, take a look at actransit.org slash realign, which is R-E-A-L-I-G-N. Um, so appreciate your time and partnership and have a great evening. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, please email me. My email is on the website and we'd love to share um, information about how to take the survey on our website. I've seen the posters at the bus stop um, and I strongly encourage everyone to take that survey. The seven was a lifeline for me um, for many, many years. So I'm hoping that that losing, we're not going to lose our line. Um, Pat, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. This is Pat Gillette. I just want to say that um, going forward, I really hope there's a lot of contentious issues that are going to be facing your board and the fire board. And I just really hope that we can all keep in mind that we're working for the same goal, which is the safety of the community. Having served on a board that was highly contentious and uh, <laughs> difficult um, in a lot of respects, I would not recommend either board go there. We don't need to be enemies. We don't need to be 
right or wrong. We need to be correct for what we're trying to accomplish in the community. So I really hope that everybody can keep that in mind. It's not personal. This is just the business of the community. And I appreciate what you guys are doing. I appreciate what the fire board's doing. And I really hope that we can come together and get rid of our reputation as a highly contentious community. <laughs> we don't deserve that, none of us. So let's try to keep in mind that we're working toward the same end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Any other comments in the room? Um, we'll now turn to director comments. I beg of my colleagues to keep it short because I want to get home to my babies. <laughs> Uh, Director Goff? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Director Duggan. I'll keep it super brief. I just want you all to know that I am taking my special assignment of long-term legal protection of Kensington Park seriously. I have been working with Anne Danforth and community members. I jockeyed for position on this agenda tonight, but I did it too late. So I didn't get any space on this agenda. We have a lot more important things to do, but we will be getting to that. And thank you all for attending. Thank you, Director Duggan. Um, Director Hazai. My only question is whether or not uh, folks would be open to uh, moving the consideration of the KCC contract ahead of the budget. I expect that the budget may take a bit of time and a lot of questions, and the KCC reps are here. They've uh, One of them has sat through the other meeting, and um, I, it also has an impact on the budget, and I'm not sure whether um, the GM actually, I have to look at that figure, but uh, so it might be good to, to do in advance if folks would be open to that. I'm fine with that. Okay, Director Goff, did you have a comment? I was just going to make a really brief comment um, generally that um, there's a lot of positive momentum uh, in our district and on our board right now. Um, we're uh, addressing a number of issues and have a really uh, positive dynamic. And I personally am very excited about that and what lies ahead. And I just hope the community can remember that. And um, I still think the best days for Kensington are ahead. So that's all. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we, we'll turn to reports. Uh, and. Uh, Chief Gankas uh, unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, so um, his report is posted, part of the packet. If you have any questions, please email us or email him directly. Um, okay, the general manager's report. Do you have any comments, David? Be happy to answer. I'll be happy to answer any questions about my report. I have none. Any other directors? Okay. Um, consent calendar. So um, I'd like to turn to the consent calendar, which includes approving meeting minutes from April 13, 2023. Um, I'd like to ask if anyone from the board or GM wishes to pull anything. Hearing none, seeing none. So, excuse me, but it's there was a special meeting minute in there and there was the regular meeting minutes oh my apologies moving and then there's also the bills for april that we're asking to ratify under the whole consent calendar right thank you any anyone want to pull anything okay then i i'll second that linnell can you call director duggan Director Hasai? Yes. Vice President Goff? Yes. Director Spath? Yes. And President Aquino, five? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Let me ask a question. Um, now that we are not, the board is not remote, can we uh, go by acclamation or do we have to do a roll call on everything? We started doing roll calls for everything when we were in on Zoom, and I just wonder whether we still need to do that. This is subject to the normal garden variety Brown Act provision, so you do not have to do roll call vote except if it's an ordinance, which it's not. Great, thank you. Okay, turning to our main discussion and action items. Um, first uh, up is approving a resolution number 2023-05, a resolution of the board of directors for KPPCSD, honoring William Driscoll for his outstanding service to the community of Kensington. 
David, do you want to make some comments? Yes, I've only been here three months, but I just told Mr. Driscoll that I've heard his name more than anyone else's name since I've been here, and it's all been in a very positive light. Um, everyone I speak to uh, speaks very highly of what um, William Driscoll has done for this community. Uh, his history is very interesting, and um, anyone that should talk to him about it and get a little background of his family and what they've done in this community. Um, but so many times we have board meetings where we deal with things that are not pleasant or divisive, but I know that this resolution here is positively appreciated by everyone in the community. And um, Mr. Driscoll, we um, have a resolution that we will deliver to you. Um, and I'm going to just read it very quickly, if you don't mind. Whereas William Driscoll is a lifetime resident in the community of Kensington, and whereas William Driscoll has been involved in the youth hut and landscaping with his dad, and whereas William Driscoll since 1998 has dedicated his time, energy, and resources to Kensington and caring for the park facilities, and whereas William Driscoll has been faithful and true to carrying out for the Kensington, to caring for the Kensington Park facilities. And whereas the board of directors of this district and the community desires to express its appreciation to William Driscoll for his invaluable service, expertise, and care to the community of Kensington. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the board of directors of the Kensington Police Protection and Community Services District that this board of directors does hereby express to William Driscoll its gratitude and appreciation for the services he has rendered as a member of the board of directors of this district and for his unrelenting, devoted, and unceasing efforts for and on behalf of this district and the community of Kensington. Be it further resolved that the secretary of the board of directors of this district shall be and hereby is authorized and directed to deliver a copy of this resolution to William Driscoll. So we very much appreciate your years of service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Driscoll, for your service and contributions to the community. We are truly grateful. Um, I know other long-term Board members might have some comments. I'd love to hear from from Bill first. Oh, I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure working here in um, such a great community, and I've been lucky enough to to have this job to help put my kids through through private school and college. It's a you know, besides my full time job, but um, it's been great, and I thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll just speak. Uh, this resolution on behalf of the board is really on behalf of the community. And there have been many young people that have grown up and seen you, maybe you've even seen some coming back as parents. I'm not quite sure of the math there. But um, I, uh, I too, as a new board member, heard Bill's name a lot and really enjoyed getting to know him and seeing the personal care and pride he took in everything he did. And, you know, um, Communities are made up of people and people are what make things happen. And, and Bill has made a lot of things happen here. His historical knowledge of lots of things about these buildings and these grounds are going to be missed. I, I know we'll be able to reach out if we ever get really stumped. But on behalf of so many previous board members and community members, really heartfelt thanks and best wishes for your coming adventures ahead. And thank you for your patience and sitting through. <laughs> oh. uh, Director Spath. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Bill, for all your work over the years, um, keeping the tennis courts in good shape because I enjoyed playing on them, you know, and also the basketball courts, which I also enjoyed. So thank you very much um, and thank good luck. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for everything. Thank you. Yeah. 
So we need to make a motion, right? I would like to just make one correction. You gave Bill what some might consider a promotion and many would consider a demotion. You referenced him as his service as a member of the board of directors. That's probably from a previous resolution that should be corrected. Um, we don't want to tarnish his record. <laughs> I know you did. But <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I'd like to accept your suggestion of moving the KCC contract uh, ahead. So thank you, thank you both also for your patience. <laughs> um, so um, we need a motion to move it. Okay. Oh, excuse me. I move that we approve resolution number 2023-05. I'll second. All right. So we can do uh, all in favor. <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Nope. Okay. The motion passes. The resolution passes. Um, let's turn to the KCC contract. Director Hassai. Thank you. So yes, when you thank uh, Kathy and Ann for their patience, they've been patient for probably about nine or nine months. So um, I am gonna introduce this item. Uh, there's a lot of history in the recitals about uh, why we did what we did. Both uh, organizations agreed that the contracts, loosely called contracts that we've been operating under really needed some rigor and uh, really wanted to make sure that responsibilities roles were clearly defined uh, as, uh, People move in and out of roles in, as board members, as staff. It's really important on bo in both organizations that that there's a good reference for you know what folks' obligations and um, expectations are to be. So that's a little bit of the background as to why um, the board and the KCC um, chose to. Uh, renegotiate a whole new contract because we had to terminate the old one in order to get to this point um, to start kind of afresh. So I can run through some of, there are some cor uh, some corrections that we'll need to make. Um, I can go through those first, maybe, I don't know, as I go through the sections. Um, so the recitals just kind of give a little bit of background history. Um, we'd like, and I'd like to ask um, whether we can, in the recital, change that to June 30th um, number I as a way of extending the current contract through June 30th, because this one will start July 1st. And rather than have a separate motion and resolution, can we in here add June 30th and by doing so basically extend the contract? Um, what I would do is amend recital J to say, uh, to add at the end of that, and desire wishes also to extend the contract with KCC to, uh, did we say June 30th? J or I? A J. Okay. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't, I thought it was I. We can add it to I also. It doesn't. Okay. Matter. I'll add it to I if you prefer. Um, so we would add and desires now to extend the agreement until June 30, okay. 2023. So that's the first thing just for consistency uh, sake. Um, so the um, second section uh, or first section one um, basically talks about the um, the reasons why and the types of facilities that the KCC uh, uses and the kinds of services they provide. Um, there are more um, sort of uh, details provided in the various exhibits. Uh, one is um, exhibit A, and there is a change to that exhibit as well. So if we can go to exhibit A, um, I don't have a page number, but um, we're just changing one word uh, in exhibit A section C, um, KCC, instead of saying will or shall run adult and family programs, we're saying may. Uh, that just provides for the KCC to continue to evaluate the um, flexibility, the desirability, the financial viability of offering these programs because um, it's still uh, relatively new as a, as a main focus. And um, we have to see what our community uh, really wants before. So we don't want to mandate that they're doing it. Um, that's their intention and they've reserved time and are dedicating efforts, but they don't want to be sort of called out in breach of contract because they are not doing it if it doesn't work out for them. So that's another change we'd like to make in exhibit A. Um, 
So as I said, um, section one really talks a lot about the use of the facilities under what conditions and for what purposes. Um, section two is a facilities use fee, um, which uh, very clearly um, outlines what we will be providing. Many of these things, uh, some of the things have not changed in what we do. The biggest change is that this is gonna go from a triple net lease to, which means that the KCC would have been responsible for all maintenance repairs of the building, except for the roof, to now the district sort of taking on that responsibility. The, the KCC and the community gave this district and this community a gift back when they helped get the land and preserve this building and renovated this building for recreation programs. But in fact, it is a district asset and the um, the maintenance, upkeep, and long-term investment in that should be made by the entire community because it's an it's a something the entire community believes in and wants. Um, uh, so that is one reason why it's being changed. And also, as a district, we have certain responsibilities about how we bid out projects, about having to pay prevailing wage. Those are all things that we really should take on. Um, so. That uh, is the biggest change really in this section as to um, what the base charge pays for, but also um, reflecting the fact that we, we did have a building inspection to kind of get everybody on the same page as to what kind of condition the building's in. It's been quite a number of years uh, since it's been renovated. They The KCC did one recent in my tenure major repair, but um, having a building inspection was really great to kind of you know, codes change, all kinds of things change. So that report is also referenced in here um, as um, sec. So this is mostly getting it down to section three. And there is a report, I believe it's exhibit E, if my memory, oh, no, it's not. Yeah, it's exhibit E. And there's a very detailed building inspection. And um, the KCC has agreed to contribute toward those um, expenses. Uh, with an annual installments of $30,000 for four years. That brings them to $120,000 at the end of it all. And that is primarily an estimate of some of the larger items, uh, save the roof, which was never uh, their responsibility. So we, um, that's how we kind of came up with that. Um, we also just uh, wanted to put in some you know, we've already get get reports from Jenny monthly, but it's important for the community to know who our, um, you know, major nonprofit partner is in providing services. So there are some reporting requirements that we hope will just uh, eliminate confusion. And uh, when the community has questions about either organization, they will have the answers uh, because we will have the answers as well. Um, because there are times when the community comes to us and really they need to go to the KCC to, to get answers for certain things. But we will have reports and financial information available um, on a, a minimum annual for some information and then, you know, after uh, recreation sessions for others. Um, getting into operations, uh, most of this, again, codifies things that were already happening, but makes it just clear the various responsibilities. And I, you know, draw attention to the general manager that this is going to require some real going through this contract, making sure it's very clear what our responsibilities are. I want to make sure that we are living up to them um, and we know what they are because I believe they are, you know, more, more has fall, a little bit more falls on the district and it's important to, um, to keep that in mind. Um, so, uh, and then on um, general provisions, these are, tend to be a little bit standard, um, I would say legalese, but it gets to one of the biggest changes that happened in California, which is the um, rules around independent contractors and how they are treated. So that's also addressed in this contract. Um, and uh, some definitions, again, to make things clear. Um, and then a lot of very detailed exhibits. Um, so that's just kind of a really quick Overview. I uh, let's see. There were some other changes I need to bring up. Um, so we made the change to recitals number, uh, rather letter I. We made the change to um, the uh, the may uh, versus will, and then in the section around the um, facility schedule, which is uh, another exhibit, I believe, exhibit. D, yes, exhibit D. Um, we want to change um, the second part of that chart 
Um, there is a section that talks about the community center lawn barbecue during the summer session. And apologies for some of the uh, printing. Uh, if you printed it, it may not have looks as clear online. But um, the time for the KCC's uh, time to end there should match other summer program end times, which is 6 p.m. So not 5 p.m., but that's going to be changed to 6 p.m. And the same note that exists in other places, which is that the district may request access beginning at 5.30 p.m., which request shall not be unreasonably refused, uh, will apply there. And that really just allows for flexibility if we have a rental and the rental needs to get in a little earlier to set up. Um, Jenny, uh, the current parks uh, recreation director, and Rosa, our park administrator, are you know working together collaboratively. And this sort of just puts into writing the kind of process that's already happening on a you know weekly basis or on a monthly basis. So that's a quick run through. Um, it's not a very long contract, but it was a very well um, considered one, I would say, and um, really worked hard. And I feel like uh, my my feeling is uh, I'm very happy with it. I think their board is very happy with it. Uh, and uh, General Counsel Aunt Danforth has something to say. I should mention, oh yes, record that there is a new section six ten. It's mm -hmm. uh, more boring legalese, I'm afraid, but it has to do with interpretation of the contract and that ambiguities will not be construed against either party. Um, lawyers in the room will know what all of that means. Um, but I just thought for the record, I should note it. Yeah, I explained it that because we were the primary drafters of the contract, we wanted to make sure that um, it's an additional risk for us. And uh, we are going to then strike the line for uh, on the last page under the signatures. Uh, our council will approve as to form, but we are not requiring the Kensington Community Council to have their council sign as well. And that 6.10 helps us deal with that. So yeah, available for questions. Any questions from the board? I well, I personally want to thank you and the board and staff of the KCC for your patience and all your hard work. Uh, I know this took way longer than we ever expected, but um, I'm pleased with I'm really pleased with what we've got in front of us. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, the, I'm sorry. Uh, look at point five point seven. You reference uh, section four point seven. I think you mean reference five point seven. Last sentence. Yes, there is no yeah. four point seven. That That's just minor. But I, I also want to thank you, Sylvie, for all the work. It's taken a lot of effort to get to this endpoint, and uh, your patience was uh, <laughs> very. Very well um, respected, and I'm glad you got it done. Director Duggan. And thank you to Kathy and Anne and your board. Yeah, I, uh, Director uh, Goff. Yeah, I just extend my thanks to all of you as well. And I think it's quite a milestone to formalize this and hopefully it doesn't have to be done again for a really long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh. And it's great that you guys are working on the building and you have, you know, this great well, that, that's, part. And yeah, that's a long-term project for the district to, you know, work with KCC to make sure that we uh, take into consideration their schedule and needs, but to start getting that work done. And, you know, there's quite a bit, but that's okay. It just gives us a, um, a honey-do list. We have a uh, comment or question in the audience. You want to give them? <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a recreation program that arrives here by truck and makes use of our facilities that's not part of KCC. I'm wondering what umbrella does that fall under, if any? There, should there be some kind of liability that's required of them the same as it's required of KCC? This has been quite an elaborate effort for a formalized recreation program and then there's sort of this pop-up and yeah i'll let you answer that i mean basically the reason this is so 
strenuous and stringent is because we are contracting for these services. Uh, I'll let uh, David and Anne comment on what could happen uh, with you know, any member of the public or anyone else working in our area. Well, my my view of this is that we need to address it. And anyone that is in a, in a professional capacity of, of providing some kind of um, recreation or fitness, we need to address and get the proper paperwork done. So we're going to have to, I mean, it, that's not part of this agenda item, but we're going to have to address it. Thank you. Thank you. I would be curious to hear from general counsel about what kind of um, exposure or what we might, I guess we can address it later. We have got other things. Well, I'll talk about it later. I see a hand up in Zoom, Paul or Vita. You can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Alex. I want to applaud the board for uh, bringing this to the end line. Uh, after all, people move to Kensington for its safety through our police, for its fine school, and for the recreation and after-school programs that we offer in our park. So thank you for bringing all this together as, as what makes us Kensington. Thank you, Rita. Okay, any other comments from the board? Okay. So I would like to make a motion that uh, the board adopts the agreement that is before us, the agreement between the Kensington Police Protection and Community Services District and the Kensington Community Council regarding recreation and educational program services with the changes that were outlined. Uh, would you like me to outline them again? No. I, no. I the council does because we know this like the back of our hand. Okay, so that's my motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Okay. Congratulations. And with that anticlimactic end. <laughs> thank, you. thank God. Um, Linnell, someone unmuted. I would just, yeah, I, I could assist if you'd like in uh, moving people back and forth. Uh, and they have to be muted each time. And I don't know if you want to make me a co-host, I can help. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the proposed budget for 2024. So based on our situation that um, I walked into February, it's kind of a miracle that um, the collaboration between the chief and um, Eddie Bailey and myself um, have produced a draft budget here. Um, with that said, I, I want to highlight a number of things, both to the board as well as to those on uh, Zoom and our audience here in person. Uh, first of all, the the advantage of being able to present a draft budget here in May um, allows us some time for people to digest the budget and ask questions. Second of all, it allows for what the government code, the CSD government code says as follows. The board of directors shall publish the notice at least two weeks before the hearing in at least one newspaper or general circulation in the district. And that's based on the fact that there needs to be a public hearing prior to the adoption of the um, <laughs> the budget. Thank you. Wow. Um, so with that said, I called upon uh, Director Spath and also uh, Mike Logan, who many know, who used to be part of the Finance Committee, from what I understand, years ago, and received their initial input. They had some very good questions. I had some answers. Uh, we need to make some corrections already in the way the formatting is. One of the key questions that was asked that needs an answer is okay here's your budget but what's the big financial picture of the district and the goal is that um, we have that in hand when we present the budget at the june meeting um, that's the goal 
Um, they're going to, Eddie Bailey's going to do everything they can to put all that together, uh, show us what our um, holdings are, and hopefully be, we'll be able to um, give a good picture to everyone in regard to the Kensington Police Protection Community Service District's finances moving into the next fiscal year. With that said, um, I'm happy to answer questions tonight. I'm not saying that I can answer them. Um, I'm, I'm encouraging all, and you can share this with others, they're welcome to contact me by my email and ask questions um, that I can answer that is also beneficial for a full ability to present hopefully a good budget in June. The public hearing that's required at the June meeting that we'll have scheduled to start at six with some other public hearings that are required by the government code, um, hopefully will not lead to a delay in the budget, and that's why I'm asking for people to reach out in advance. With that, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions or comments. Any questions or comments from the board? Director Spath? Uh, let me just say, uh, having had the opportunity to look at this uh, ahead of time, I, I have to compliment the general manager for putting this together <laughs> from very little knowledge about the district and its financial situation. So I appreciate uh, what he's done already. Um, he's answered a number of questions I've had, and there's still some outstanding ones, but at least we're on the right track. And I do appreciate the comment about looking forward because I think this district has to do some good financial analysis, not on a year to year basis, but looking forward on possibly even a five year prediction of of finances going forward. So thank you again. Director Hassai. Um, I just wanted to know whether or not you had um, attributed the contract, which I know had not been adopted, but you were aware as things were progressing, if that's part of this budget or not. It is. Thank you. Um, and uh, at one time we started doing two-year budgets. I know you think that's a good idea and um, maybe we'll get back to that at some point, getting into line with uh, sort of five-year planning, two-year budgets, I think that could be a nice place to end up. So what I'm asking the board today to is to motion to approve us directing a staff to put the um, advertisement in the paper um, of the public hearing for the fiscal year 24 budget. Continue discussion. Yeah, Director Duggan. I have a few questions. So, looking at the third page about parks, yeah. where at the bottom under capital expenses, you see 30000 for other park improvements. Is that for the park replanting? and other projects that uh, Vice President Goff and I are working on? I'm gonna answer that in two ways. Um, one is if you look at the first page, you'll see that this is a very thinly um, balanced budget. Yeah. Um, and so, on the surface, the amount of money that's available for capital projects is basically not available. There isn't. But what I'm hoping is between tonight and our June meeting that um, we'll have the confidence to add another 180000 to the park budget that will come in the form of a grant. And you, I, you've tried to get us a grant? That might come in. Or? Well, the grant was started when this when this community center was being renovated. It wasn't finished. So when I walked in, I made contact with the state parks, and we had the inspector come up from the state today 
And she basically told us there's two things left to do. One is we need to put a sign up advertising how great the state of California is. And the, and the second is um, we need to um, take our deed that this, this center sits on for this property and um, basically have it um, uh, recorded that it's going to remain what it is. Um, and then we should be able to apply for the money. And because the project's already done, we can do whatever we want with the money. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely also wanted to, you know, just find out how much we have in our reserves, because that will have a huge impact on the PSB project. And, you know, several citizens rightfully asked that question. Um, next question on the police page. Um, at the bottom under capital expenses for this year, um, there's no request for patrol car accessories, station equipment, office furniture equipment, computer equipment, upgrade phone system. And I do know that some new items were added above. And I know the, you know, the police chief had, included the memorandum changing some stuff around, but you know, it looks like there are no capital expenses for the police. It looks like a big gap where previously like 165,000 had been budgeted. Good. It's a good point. And again, the answer is twofold. Number one, the vehicle lease is incorporated not under the capital projects, but in the lease line item. So that does get us the vehicle that mm -hmm. um, are, are possibly vehicles in fiscal year 24. And there is a list of capital needs that the chief would love to have. And what I explained to him is um, got to figure out where the money's coming from. So you may see some adjustments in that as well. And as the board knows, I've reached out to each of you as board members asking for your input on capital needs. I just want to clarify too that the previous year was relatively high because of the move uh, to the temporary location. That's one reason why the figure uh, will not be, should not be as high. That's correct. Well, they may have to move, you know, pretty soon. I guess it would be maybe in the following year's budget, the move to somewhere else. Well, more, more to discuss and research. Um, Director Spath. Yeah, and going back to the, the park grant, is, is this a grant that we had already applied for and had been approved for? Okay. Well, it was a grant that was sitting at the state's inbox that had never been signed off on by this, this agency. We, it was never completed, but it was specific to the community center. And I don't know if everyone knows, but the district expended a good amount of money and took out a loan to finish this project. Right. Um, one other point too, since we don't have the audit done yet, we really don't know what our reserves look like. Um, so, you know, it, it's sort of a, a guessing game right now. So until we have that done and at least have a better picture of what our reserves uh, do look like for this Correct. fiscal year. And what is the projected finish date of the audit? I, the fiscal year 22 audit, I can't give you an answer because we're still running into problems with a one issue. It's called GASB 75, I believe, and it involves um, doing the, the actuarial study on our retirees and what that means for liability on the health side of things. And we're, well, if you want more detail, I'll be happy to give it to you, but it, we have to go back a number of years with CalPERS to get that accurate information. So soon, <laughs> we're working on it, but we, we can't give you an, a specific ETA yet. But I know uh, David and ID Baylor are working, and excuse me, the auditors are working as fast as possible. Um, so we need a motion. Okay. One more quick comment. 
in the past, we had a finance committee, and I believe, Dave, were you on that finance committee at some point? Um, Mike Logan, Jim Watt, many other great community members, and that is a resource to help the general manager. I mean, it sounds like you kind of made your own little, yeah, exactly. You made your own little finance committee. Um, however, I'd like to think in the future, you know, maybe within the next six months or something to reconvene some sort of finance committee to be on top of this at all times. Director Hussai. Okay, um, so David, to, if I heard you right, you need a motion from us to post. A simple motion stating that you are directing the staff to um, see that um, there is a public notice of a public hearing for the um, budget for the June special, for the June board meeting at 6 p.m. Okay, I'm gonna try. <laughs> uh, I move uh, to direct our staff, our interim general manager, Aranda, to publish a notice of public hearing for June 8th, 2023, 6 p.m. regarding, <laughs> someone help me. Do I have to <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> um... That, on June 8th, we will hold a public hearing. We will hold a public hearing <laughs> on the budget to approve the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Did you get a second? Yeah. So you can just call. We did. We did. <laughs> I, I will say it louder. A motion passed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um next is um next item is to approve recommendations related to the approval of the annual Kensington Park Assessment Park. You don't need to read it all. Uh, <laughs> basically the, the district levy um and three related resolutions for fiscal year 23 to 24. Yeah. Um, so the short the short thing about this is that this is something that um that the district has been doing every year in order to see that the um a park assessment the lighting and landscape district money is uh, is approved in uh, a manner that seems to be what the legislators want so what you have is you have three resolutions and again incorporated in those resolutions is will be a public hearing at the june board at the june board meeting at 6 p.m um but in accordance with what i've seen historically done here um the board has approved all three resolutions which is a little different than what i've done in the past where i've been but i don't see it being an issue and um, as you have the study by the engineering company, uh, NBS, that they're the ones that determine um, the validity of what we're saying it costs to operate the parks versus what we take in from the lighting and landscape district levy. Any questions or comments from the board? <laughs> I would recommend a separate motion for each resolution, please. Okay, noted. Um, do I hear a motion, the first motion? I'll make the first motion. Uh, I believe it's um, resolution number 2023-06, and it's a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Kensington Police Protection and Community Services District initiating the proceedings for the levy and collection of assessments for the Kensington Park Assessment District for fiscal year 23-24. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, can I have the second? Yeah, I'll make a resolution or at least motion to approve the resolution number 2023-07 a resolution of the 
Board of Directors of the Kensington Police Protection and Community Service District approving the annual report for the, no, for the Kensington Park Assessment District for fiscal year 2023-24. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Do I hear a motion for the third and last resolution? I move that we approve the resolution number 202308, declaring the district's intention to levy and collect assessment for the Kensington Park Assessment District for fiscal year 2023-24. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, next item is discussion and approval of Director Spath's continuing continued service on the KFPD's Emergency Preparedness Committee and a request to the KFPD that he remain on that committee. Any comments or questions? Um, sorry, oh, go ahead. I'd like to say thank you to Director Spath for doing double service and helping connect our boards together. Agreed. Uh, Director? Yes, I also thank you, David. And um, I think it's a very happy circumstance that you're on this board and you were serving on that committee and you can just continue to do so, but in a more official cap capacity representing this board. And um, this sort of uh, synergy and connection uh, is important as we all try to coordinate our public safety, our emergency response. So thank you. Director Hassai. Uh, my only question is related to sort of Brown Act issues. So I understand that um, Dave Spath will be continuing as a member of this committee. Um, it's not really possible to pretend you're not a board director and everyone is agreeing that he's going to, I mean, when he speaks, I guess he can say he's speaking for himself, uh, unless there is a reason he's not. But uh, my question is about Brown Act issues. So if two other board members are there or speak or are listening, how does that impact it is a it is a public committee. Do they have public meetings, correct? Yes, it's a Brown Act committee, and they do have public meetings. He serves at the appointment of the fire board, however, and, and they would have appointed him as an individual citizen. Uh, because it's an advisory board, um, he is able to sign on it, uh, serve on it without conflict as a member of the public. He can also, of course, since he is a, a member of this board, report back. Um, if two other board members are present, though, that's my question. Uh, if it's a public meeting, there is an exception for just that as long as they are only testifying in public. The danger comes if the board members confer amongst themselves. In private. In private or even just kind of out of earshot of anyone else. So it's best to avoid anything that looks like a private conversation with your fellow directors. Thank you. Understood. Any comments or, or questions from the public? We've got one. Director Nagel. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Larry Nagel. Uh, I am a dir uh, director of the uh, Kensington Fire Protection District, and I'm the chair of the uh, uh, Emergency Preparedness Committee of the KFPD. And I just wanted to uh, publicly thank Dave for all of the time and effort that he's put in. He's been a member as long as there's been an Emergency Pre Preparedness Committee. And he's done a hell of a job. I really appreciate that. And uh, we didn't kick him out, so you don't really have to request that we take him back because he's uh, he's he's always been where and he's always been going to the meeting. So uh, whatever is required by the lawyer, I guess is fine. But thank you very much, Dave, and thank you for letting Dave continue to be on the Emergency Preparedness Committee. Thank you. Let me just say that uh, I think it's important to have representation, even though I'm not representing the board on there, 
the synergy, as you suggested, uh, Sarah, is important because we have a significant role in, in preparedness and response. And ultimately, I would like to see, and I'll ask Larry to convey this to his board, is the board actually uh, seek to have a liaison from the from our board to the committee so it's more official. Well, that would have to come from your board, I think, Larry. But anyways, be that as it may, I'm more than happy to continue uh, on the committee. Thank you, Director Spath, for your service. Uh, Director Duggan. So will that mean that you will be giving us reports? Certainly. Um, you know, whatever you'd like me to report back on, uh, more than happy to. Uh, well, we'll talk offline about the frequency of that and what, what he should report on. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, approval of resolution 2023-09, a resolution from the Board of Directors of Kensington Police Protection and Community Services District inviting the Kensington Fire Protection District to jointly move forward in exploring consolidation of the two agencies. Uh, any, David, do you have any comments or pretty self-explanatory? <laughs> Sorry. Did you have any comments on this item or otherwise I can No, I I um I I didn't speak during um Director Goff's um presentation, which was very thorough. Um I have been involved with independent special districts for almost 30 years now, and I've wondered why the Kensington entities have not consolidated over my tenure of not having anything directly to do with Kensington. Now I have something directly to do. And, and um, I thought that the, the concept of, as we've worded this resolution, the encourage of moving forward together um, is an important step. And um, so far, what I've heard from the majority of people that I've run into um, and heard at board meetings and heard just in generally speaking to them in conversations is that they would like to see that in this community. Um, so I hope that the board finds this wording um, something that is acceptable to our board and something that's acceptable to the fire district board. Thank you. Uh, Director Goff, did you have it? I would just add thank you, David, for that uh, background and that this is an exciting next step. I know I say everything is exciting, but <laughs> I, it, this does, I think, move us along. And so thank you um, for that. Let me just tell you, too, that I think it's an important first step to, to start the evaluation process and doing a physical analysis uh, would be an, also an important first step because it would give us an understanding of the feasibility of combining the two boards together and seeing if it's financially feasible and because that's an important element if it is shown to be that way for LAFCO because then we can take that and move that on assuming the fire board agrees with a proposal for um for either re consolidation or reorganization and I would also like to point out that at the last meeting with Luann uh, Teixeira, she indicated that the district could be responsible for writing the other part of the proposal, which is a plan for services. And so that would reduce the costs of going forward uh, with a proposal. So I, I, I like this first step, and I hope the fire board will agree to uh, join in a partnership with us on, on this effort. Yeah, I'd like to add that this is definitely just a first step to begin the necessary research and analysis. Um, we are nowhere near a final recommendation or decision, although I know what I would like to be the out, the final outcome, but we have a lot of work to do and we hope that the fire board would be amenable to participating and collaborating with us and just getting the right information in front of us. Director Goff. Sorry, I did just want to also add that in, in taking this next step and then ultimately um, pursuing a financial analysis together would then provide us with the information. We can then go back to the community and really share some, some helpful content with them about this is what it would actually mean and how do you feel about it now. 
And so we wouldn't be skipping that step. It would just be a more thorough and effective uh, gauge of their actual interest and awareness on this issue, which again, I think is pretty clear, but always helps to be doubly clear on something that's important. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to approve this resolution? I move to approve the resolution resolution to the Kensington Fire Protection District, encouraging moving forward together in evaluating consolidation slash reorganization of the, the agencies into one agency. I'd like to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And our uh, final item is authorization to enter into a lease purchase or a purchase agreement for the procurement of one hybrid police vehicle. David? Um, I included the, some information that this was a board discussion for a number of vehicles a, a few years ago. And again, due to budget constraints, um, they they tailored down the number. Um, the chief is get, trying to get back to what he originally asked for. And the whole um, issue here is he'd like to place an order because of the delay it takes nowadays to get uh, police vehicles. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we did budget for this under the leasing line item to add a patrol car. And I'll probably, unless something changes, be coming back in another six months or so for possibly another one. But the leasing arrangement works pretty well. He, The, the police department with um, the chief's experience from a prior um, agency he was with does a really good job on the fleet control uh, of the police vehicles. So have we budgeted for one or two in? The, the budget reflects two. Okay. Right now I'm asking just to place an order for one. Understood. Director Goff. And did I read correctly that doing it this way with the lease to own and these hybrid vehicles is actually saving us money? It probably was. My concern, to be quite frank, is the interest rates. So when we go out to get this lease, um, we might find out that it's not as cost effective as it was when we did the other vehicles. Um, but with that said, the other aspect is the district really doesn't have the cash flow to just um, put the full amount of money down on a vehicle. And, and there are savings with, um, excuse me for jumping in, there are savings for uh, obviously fuel and repairs and maintenance. And so this was, um, when we originally did this, the request I think had been for five, I can't quite remember the numbers, but doing that at once was really not feasible. And it made more sense in fleet management to rotate them in and out. So background. Thank you. Director Spath. Uh, a quick question as to the number of vehicles we're now leasing. This is the fifth one. Uh, that we will be leasing that there was three and then one i think in 2022 and now this one I believe if you go to your um uh spreadsheet that the chief did um you've got the 2021 vehicles if i'm not mistaken um were the original order and then the 2022 so that's four. So yeah, this order, this one would be the fifth. Right. That's what I understand. And it's also important to note that the maintenance costs, as you see in vehicle 1601, is rather significant. So man, it is time to start looking at uh, vehicles that have lower maintenance costs and better fuel efficiency. Yeah. The, and uh, I... I I'm looking down the road, but the chief will make another presentation on his his whole um, concept of what he's trying to do. That, so you might want to hold on to this page <laughs> um, because the cost of some of these older vehicles on maintenance, it, it, it's time to make some changes. I just wanted to say I'm not so sure that that silver car is also part of this deal. I, I believe those were all for hybrid patrol cars and that silver detective admin car. I'm not sure that's part of this lease agreement. 
to be honest, but, but it's at least three, there's at least three of them here. I'm not sure about the, about the silver car. Okay, noted. Um, Director Duggan. I believe we've currently got five because we're going to convert the silver car to a patrol car. And, you know, then we have five and this will be vehicle number six. Yeah. Talking about what's part of the lease agreement and what are hybrid vehicles yeah. under yeah, this. I actually wasn't responding to yours. I was responding. No, what, what you're both saying is, is correct. Okay. So what my comment would be is we do need the one additional vehicle that I'm asking for tonight. Then I'm going to let the chief make a presentation on the entire fleet in the months to come on this additional vehicle that we budgeted for. And the, the, the way I think in budgeting is we're going to make a commitment on this. But as we're going through the fiscal year and something comes up that was unexpected, we may not be able to order that. So I'm fudging, I guess, is the word to use on where we're spreading the money and when we're going to order these things. Got it. No. Nope. I appreciate that approach. Um, do I hear a motion uh, to authorize uh, the district? I'll, I'll make the motion that um, we authorize the districts and the district staff to enter into a lease purchase agreement for the procurement of one hybrid police vehicle and the related emergency equipment. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. That is the last item of today's agenda. The next regular meeting is scheduled for June 8th, 2023. I want to thank everyone for their patience and letting me speed through this so I can go see my kids. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>